Turn with me in your copy of God's word to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, as we continue to preach through the gospel of Luke, we come now to verses 19 through, the, through verse 31. Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 19. This is the word of God. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that will come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Amen. As far as the reading of God's, most holy word. Brethren, if reading or having heard this read does not shock you, then I would say you've probably grown too familiar with this text. This text should shock you. This text should cause you to think more closely about your walk with Christ. I have titled this sermon, Real Words from the Afterlife. Mankind has often thought, we'll say mankind has been obsessed with the afterlife. Just look at human history. What do we find in human history but man obsessed with the afterlife? Just go to any archaeological gravesite. When they dig up the tombs of kings and of the rich and powerful, what do they find? But these great men and women buried with much gold and jewels, even their servants, most of the time, are buried alive so that they will accompany them into the afterlife, thinking that they can bring all their grandeur into the afterlife with them. The Greeks would put two coins on the eyes of the dead man to pay the boatman across the river Styx. 
Mankind has been obsessed with the afterlife. Even in our own day, we see the same. City after city after city. I've lived in different parts of this country. I've lived in other countries. I've traveled to many different countries. And what do you see everywhere in this so-called day of science? Palm readers, seances, where people can go and meet with, most of the time, a woman that will conjure up the dead for them so that they can hear some word from a departed loved one or even a pet here in America. Time and again, man is obsessed, even in our own day, with what is in the afterlife. In the 1990s, where near-death experiences were all the rage, you would hear constantly about this light at the end of the tunnel. Until, of course, it was all proven to be a hoax. All these stories, basically hoaxes. But that's fascinating, man. What happens after death? What happens when you die? Science cannot, will never be able to tell you what happens after death. Even some conservative Christians have gotten into the game with their <clears throat> supposed contacts with departed saints. Or even some that uh, will say they receive words from Jesus. And then they write it in a book and sell a lot of books off of that. You hear all these things happening, even in some Reformed churches. Congregation, all of these instances are nothing but flat-out lies and falsehoods. They're all hoaxes and cons. Many times, these are works of the demonic. The dead don't come back and talk to anyone. It does not happen. The fact of the matter is that once a person dies, their spirit goes to God. They don't hang out on earth to quote-unquote haunt people. It does not happen. Hauntings don't happen by a departed loved one. Supposed hauntings, most of the time, are false. False. And when they are true, they're the work of demons. Because they do happen. It's not common, it's rare, but they do happen. And there's the work of demons. Many times, however, they're scams. Conceived through superstition. Or to get get over on people. Some people just like to do scam, just like to scam people, not for the sake of money, but for the thrill of it. That's the work of a con man. Unless you think of um, King Saul and the witch of Endor and Samuel, that was not Samuel. That was a demon. Samuel was with God. Well, what happens when we die? What happens? Here we have the first ever recorded interaction between actual humans who died and what the afterlife really is like. We are given this by the special revelation of Jesus Christ, who alone of all of mankind could really tell us what happens in the afterlife, since he is also God. And therefore, he knows exactly what the afterlife, afterlife is. So let us pay close attention to what the Lord teaches us here and set aside whatever you may have learned or heard about the afterlife, especially if it's from a non-Christian perspective. First, the, the narrative as a whole. I will agree with the theologian John Calvin that I believe this is really a narrative and less a parable. It's not too much of a parable because you see Christ actually names people in this narrative. He names Lazarus and Abraham. He discusses real and existing places like hell 
and paradise. No other parable does this. He speaks of actual places and actual people. It appears to be a narrative of a true event. Christ employs his divine knowledge of all things to reveal to us the reality of this sphere of the afterlife that no living man can know. In order to teach a lesson to the Pharisees first and foremost, because remember the context of this chapter, he's speaking to the Pharisees, and then to teach his disciples, and then to instruct the crowd around them, and lastly to us who read these words. And these words are meant to be a warning for us today. But if you want to say that this is a parable, that's fine. It does not change the truth of what is taught here. But everything that is taught here is real. There is really a hell and there is really a heaven. It's not metaphor. It's not analogy. It's not simile. These are real places. And these are places that people really go to. Another truth that we learn here is that when you die, you are in fact conscious. You are alert. You are aware of what's around you and what's happening to you. There's interaction even. So these verses refute and go against the error of soul sleep. When we die, our souls do not sleep. Our bodies are buried. <coughs> but our souls are very much aware, and they feel. This, these verses, this narrative refutes the error of soul sleep. The soul is very much aware of what's going on when we die. So it is reality that Christ is describing here. This is why I'm persuaded it is not too much of a parable, and it is a story. So recall the text, context. Jesus is addressing the Pharisees on the topic of what? Of wealth, pomp, and circumstance, how they were a covetous people. He has contrasted the proper use of wealth versus the covetous and envious use of wealth. With his narrative, he brings it home by directly addressing a reality which all mankind will face in due time, which is death, followed by a quick judgment. You see, the Pharisees, as you remember, were a covetous group of conservative religious leaders who instead of living lives of humility and charity, that usually is the result of deep study of the word of God, instead live the life of wealth, luxury, covetousness, and narcissism. The contrary fruits of learning about God. See, the more you're in the word of God, the more humble you should be. It should drive you to humility, not to conceit or covetousness. The fault was not in their wealth. We've talked about this already. Being rich is not a sin. There's no sin in being rich. There's no sin in being poor. It's how you approach your wealth or your poverty that determines whether you are in sin or not. Their fault was not in their wealth, but their love of wealth their stinginess with their wealth. They had a false view of riches. You see, the Pharisees truly believed that the wealthier you were, the more it was a sign, an indication that God was blessing you. It was a sure sign. Well, look at how prosperous I am. I must be, uh, must be blessed of God. But look at that poor person. Certainly, he's not blessed of God. Because if he was blessed of God, he wouldn't be poor. Congregation, 
never fall into this trap. Never fall into this trap. Never believe that great success in the things of the world always means that God is favoring you or blessing you. Because it does not mean that. It could be that God has cursed you and will use your love of wealth and power to condemn you, as in the case of this rich man. And yet the flip side is true. Never think that poverty is a sure sign that you will go to heaven since you suffered hell on earth. Quite the contrary. Your poverty may certainly be a sign of God's justice for your sins. You see, if poverty falls upon you due to sinful choices and decisions, then you will reap what you sow. And not just you, but your spouse and your children. In other words, your social or economic status does not truly mean anything regarding your standing with God. There are many who are very much on the left, liberals, that will say, well, all poor people will go to heaven. That is not true. That is also a lie. God does not judge us by our status in life. He doesn't. If that was the case, if God judges us by our economic sta status, then we all should be out there as beggars and in rags with sores. That is not the truth. So let us look at this text. Verse 19, no, um, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fur sumptuously every day. Here's a rich man, clothed in purple and fine linen. This tells us much about him. Fine linen back then was the most expensive cloth. It was handmade, imported from Egypt. Only the rich could afford it. If you um, ever Google fine linen clothing today that's handmade, you'll find out how expensive it is even today. Look at it this way. There are people that are wealthy and they'll wear, you know, Gucci or Louis Vuitton or something like that, right? A lot of people, the guys wear their Nikes, that Nikes are like $500 or something like that, right? He was rich. He wore purple. Purple back then was only affordable by the rich and nobility because the color purple was extruded from a shellfish, which was hard to find. You had to dive into the water, pull it out, and then secrete it. And you need a lot of them just to make that dye. So he was powerful. He, he fared sumptuously, meaning he had, he had full meals every single day. He ate good. He ate so good, I'm sure there is a lot left over. He was powerful. He was a powerful man. He had servants. He had a large home. This guy was living a good life. He was living a good life. Look at verse 21. Or to verse 20 and 21. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Where was this beggar? He was at the gate of the rich man. The, he, the rich man had a gate with a long walkway to his house. And there was Lazarus at the end of the gate waiting to see if all that food that they were throwing away will be shared with him. He'll, he'll eat whatever they chewed on, and they got tired of chewing whatever food they were eating, and they set it aside and was being thrown away. He was willing to eat that. You ever seen a person going through a garbage can, and they find a half-eaten uh, cheeseburger, and they just start eating it? He was willing to do that. The rich man wouldn't even give him that. He wouldn't give him that. He wouldn't even give him that. He was a beggar, begging. The rich man ignored him. On top of this, he has sores. What kind of sores? Like when you cut yourself? No. 
The Greek here means ulcers. He had open wounds all over him. He lived in pain. <clears throat> so much so was he in pain and hardly could get around. He would beg that the dogs came to lick him. I mean, that's dehumanizing, isn't it? But in one way, it's a rebuke by Christ towards people like this. That the dogs share, uh, show charity towards this man. The dogs showed him charity. But the rich man ignored him day after day after day after day. But we know something about this poor man, this beggar, don't we? We know that he was a believer. He prayed. Pretty sure he went, made it to synagogue. Even if he was outside where you can hear. Because we read that he dies and is carried. By the angels. You see, the Lord has appointed angels to do the work of sifting the wheat from the ch chaff, to sift between a goat and a sheep. It is the angels that come and take the departed to their appointed place. They bring the spirits of the dead to their appointed places. Heaven if they believe in Jesus Christ, or hell, if they have denied Jesus Christ. And we are told here that Lazarus ends up in Abraham's bosom. What does it mean, Abraham's bosom? Children, what do you do when, when your dad comes home? Don't you go and greet him, hug him? Bosom is the chest area, right? You hold him. Or... If you're grown and you haven't seen your parents for a while and you go and visit them, you, you give them an embrace, right? You hug them. It's a, it's a demonstration of intimacy, of closeness. You hug them. You bring them close to you. This means that when Lazarus died, he went where Abraham is. He was greeted and received by the people of God. Paradise or heaven. As we read from Galatians 3 earlier, we are taught there that all who believe in Jesus Christ are called the children of Abraham. And that we share in the faith of Abraham. So if you are in Christ, you are a child of Abraham in that sense. He is like a father because he believed in Jesus before us. And Galatians says that on same faith, we have standing in Christ for our salvation. So G Jesus is using Abraham's bosom as a metaphor for heaven. But what's the contrast? The contrast is that the rich man dies and is buried. Period. You see that? In verse 22, he, he just tells us, the rich man also died and was buried. Nothing more, right? No commentary. Nothing about the pomp and circumstance that the rich man certainly received at his burial. Nothing about the overblown and exaggerated eulogies his loved ones and friends showered upon him at his gravesite. Why, wow, he was such a good man. He did so much good to people. He was so rich. Of course, he was blessed of God. He had the the word of God memorized. He was, look at how great this guy was. Look how many people have shown up for his funeral. Surely he was a great person. God, Christ doesn't tell us any of that because it's a given that this most likely happened. Happens in our own day, doesn't it? Every time some big star dies, right? A movie star dies, a musician dies, he is eulogized as if he was a saint. Surely he is in heaven now, they will say. And Jesus weighs all that off. There is no importance in the words of men with these hypocritical eulogies. 
Instead, Jesus focuses on what really matters. Your position with God. And so he tells us the truth about the rich man. Verse 23, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, <clears throat> sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. See, Jesus tells us where this rich man ends up. In hell. He ends up in hell. His body is in the grave. His soul, however, is very much awake, aware, and with full sensation. And what do we learn? He is in torments. He is in torments. How many of you that don't have a chronic condition, when you do have an illness or migraine that just pounds at you and just won't go away, and all you can desire is for that relief to come. And when it comes, you're like, wow, I'm glad that's over. Imagine never being relieved of that. It's worse in hell because the torments do not end. Some people that suffer from chronic illness get at least a little bit, a little bit of relief from their pain when they eventually fall asleep for that hour or two or three of sleep where their, they, their pain is forgotten because they're asleep. But in hell, there is no day nor night. It's continual. And this guy is alone. This rich man, he is alone. He is alone in hell. And we know hell is populated, full of people, but he is alone. Because this is part of the torments. You see, many people think, Oh, all the cool people will go to hell. It's just going to be one big party in hell. Because look at all the people that don't believe in Jesus. They're party people. They're going, to, and they're saying they're going to go to hell. Well, that's fine. It's going to be one big party. No, it's not. You're going to be isolated. You're going to be in solitary confinement. There will be no sun. But the flame. That and every memory of your sin and every memory of when you heard the gospel and said no to Jesus. How many of you have ever committed something in life that you just regret and, it, and those times it pops up in your head and you're like, I should never have done that, I should never have done that, and you regret it. Well, this will be continual. It's part of the torments of hell. And the fires of hell will be burning so hot, the smoke so intense, you will never see anyone. You hear, you will hear their wailing and their gnashing of teeth. You will hear it. You hear them crying out as you cry out. You never find them. How many of you ever been to a party or a large dinner? You're surrounded by people, yet you feel isolated. Alone. You see them, but you don't feel it to be part of it. Hell is going to be like that. You know there's people there. You hear them. You cannot interact with them. You're isolated in torments. He sees Lazarus afar off. Now he notices Lazarus. Now he notices him. He, he calls him by name. He notices Lazarus now. Now he notices him. And he sees him in paradise. He's in hell. Isn't that interesting? Passed him every day. Heard him crying out. Begging. Look, if you're not going to finish that, that pheasant... That lobster, can I have it? Tell any servants, ignore him, throw it in the garbage. Or feed it to the livestock, to the dogs. But don't give it to the beggar. 
But now he notices him. Verse 24, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. You see what he is asking for? Just, just the tip of Lazarus' finger with water just to cool off his tongue. Why the tongue? Why the tongue? Why not the head or the body? Why the tongue? And what do the scriptures teach us from Genesis to Revelation? That the tongue it is from the tongue that we speak blasphemy against God. It is from the tongue that we speak evil against our neighbor. It is with the tongue that we conspire and plot. It is with the tongue that we bring about ruin. A little thing. But look at the great fire sets, as James says. And he wants a little bit of water. He recognizes Lazarus. He asks, he asks for just a little bit of water. Oh, well, now he wants. Now he wants. All, you know, however long they live, he ignored Lazarus. And now he wants Lazarus not to ignore him. Surely Lazarus would have done it for him. But what does Abraham say? Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is this great gulf, which we cannot pass over. This is reality. This is reality. Abraham re replies and tells him, look, you lived good. You lived good. And he didn't. You see, it is not, Abraham's not saying, well, you know, because of your riches, you're in hell. It's because you're a covetous man. You are a greedy man. You show no charity to your fellow man. You show no love to the poor, to the ones who are without, especially when you saw them in front of you. Now, I know there's a lot of scammers nowadays, you know, at the end of the freeway and stuff like that. We'll work for food or whatever. A lot of people scam. I understand that. Lazarus was not one of those. He was truly a beggar. He truly was in want. But this rich man, full of covetousness, lacking all pity, he wants... He wants some relief, but Abraham ex explains this truth to him. Between heaven and hell is a great gulf. Can't cross over. Can't can do that. You see, when the dead die and their souls go to their respective places, the gulf between both is so large. You can't cross over. Won't happen. Notice that Lazarus does not speak to the rich man either. It's Abraham engaging him. Reminding the rich man, though I call you son, you are my son after the flesh, but not after faith. Because if you are my, truly my son after faith, you will be here with me instead there in hell. And children, this is a reminder for you. Just because you're born in a Christian home does not mean you are guaranteed to go to heaven. You must believe in Jesus Christ yourself. Your father or your mother's faith will not save you. Although you are baptized as an infant, you still must have faith in him. So what does the rich man do? Think of next. Finally, some kind of pity enters into him. Finally, some kind of pity enters into him. And he thinks of his brothers. He thinks of his brothers and says, send Lazarus 
to my brothers. Maybe they will believe. Maybe they will believe. Because he came back from the dead. And what does that tell us? That his brothers are unbelievers. They don't believe in Christ. They don't believe in God. And he's like, well, I don't want them coming here. And Abraham says, nope. They have Moses and prophets. What does that mean? That means they have the Bible. They have the Bible. And if they won't listen to the Bible, they won't listen to a person who comes back from the dead. Now, a person coming back from the dead will convince them to believe. What is the lesson for us? What is the lesson? That the torments of hell are real. It is real. And it should be sobering. It should be shocking for us. There's nothing to rejoice over. It is nothing to even gloat over if you say you're a Christian. When people spit at your face and say, I don't want to hear about the gospel, and you say to them, well, you're going to hell. That is not the proper response. It should never be the proper response. What was Christ's response on the cross when he was mocked and spat upon? He didn't look down upon them and say, ah, y'all, y'all are going to hell. He didn't say that. What did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We are to show pity. We are to show compassion. For hell is not a laughing matter. It's serious business. And here's the more sobering part. If you are a believer in Christ, know this. The only reason you are in Christ is because of his mercy. And what is mercy? Receiving that which you do not deserve. What do we deserve? We all deserve justice. And what is justice? Condemnation. Because all of us are condemned by God for violating his law. We're all born sinners. We all sin. We sin against a living God. We sin against his law. And we all deserve hell. All of us. The fact that people don't go to hell, that there are many, a multitude of people that don't go to hell, is a great demonstration of God's mercy. It's a demonstration of his mercy. Because if it was justice, then we all should be in hell. Because we are all guilty in the eyes of God. But then there's also the joy of heaven. When you believe in Christ, you will enter into paradise. You will, you, whatever pains you may have here in this life, whatever hurts you have suffered in this life, whatever people have said to despise you and to ridicule you, in this life, in heaven, there will be nothing but joy and gladness. All, all sin and all hurt will be forgotten, will be wiped away. It will be nothing in comparison to the joys of heaven. The root sin of this rich man was his love of money. Not money itself. Not wealth, but his love of it, his greediness, his inability to show mercy to others. He loved himself way too much. And he judged the poor man. Oh, he must be, he's poor because he's a sinner. His parents were sinners. Somebody was a sinner. He's getting what he deserves. How many Christians think like that today? Oh, this guy, look at him. He's unsuccessful. He's barely getting by. It must be because God is not with him. <coughs> so why should I help him? That's not the attitude we are to have. 
It should not be the attitude. Otherwise, you're no better off than the rich man in this story, in this account. And you don't want to end up where the rich man is. Because I tell you, if this is your attitude, one day when you have breathed your last breath, you will hear the rich man crying. You will hear him as you cry as well and he hears you. It's the reality of hell. What sin has you so twisted today that you refuse to believe in Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul? If you have heard the gospel and you have rejected it, I have a life to live, you say. I have things to do. There's too many pleasures to indulge in. I got all these things to do. See, these are all twisted lies that you come up with as an excuse to reject Christ. What will a man gain if he loses his soul? You see, we all live a certain amount of time here on this world. Some live but a few hours. Some live to a ripe old age. But time is short. Some of you parents are realizing this right now as your children are growing. Wow, my child has grown so quick. Where is time gone? I have six grown children, I know. Brethren, when we die, whatever, however long you live is but a drop in the bucket in comparison to eternity. For hell will be eternal. But heaven also will be eternal. This, in this lifetime, this is the lifetime God has given to you. And he says, now, Believe on Jesus Christ for the salvation of your souls, to relieve you from the guilt of sin, and you will spend eternity with me. But if you refuse to confess, to say with your lips that you have sinned against God, if you refuse to say that I don't want Jesus, if you refuse him, There is an eternity of darkness for you. Look at the name of Lazarus. Lazarus is a Greek word for the Hebrew name Eleazar. You know what Lazarus means? Whom God helps. Whom God helps. Brethren, there are many of you in this congregation that suffer from chronic illnesses, chronic conditions. And every time you see a medical specialist, they say, oh, not sure, not sure, we're not sure what to do, do this, do that. And you come away disheartened. You come away, why am I suffering? Why has God given me a body of suffering? Where is relief? Where is my relief? You cry out, you grieve. You grieve. Like Lazarus, you grieve. But like Lazarus, I want you to know this. God helps you. God is your help. And for whatever providential wisdom God has afflicted you with whatever chronic conditions you may have. Don't look upon it as, well, God must have cursed me because it is not that. God glorifies himself in each one of you in his own mysterious way. And when others look down upon you and may sneer and say, well, it must be because of some sin. Remember Lazarus. Lazarus was in his condition not because of sin. And God was his help. 
If you suffer in this life, being a Christian, know that God is still with you. He is your help. He is your relief. And there will be a time, however long you think your life is now, a time is coming where you will spend all of eternity with comfort and peace, with no more affliction in body, no more affliction of mind, no more affliction of emotion, but comfort and peace. And why? Because you trust in Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul. You truly are a son or daughter of Abraham. Look at Lazarus as an example of comfort for you. There is no near-death experiences, congregation. There is no seances that can tell you what lies in the hereafter. And no matter what you may have been told, whatever your experiences may have been, when a, a loved one departs, they depart. So you do not interact with the living. The dead go with the dead. It could be just imagination, an overaction, overreaction of emotion because of the passing of a loved one, or if worse yet, a demonic deception. But when your loved one passes, they pass. That's it. Brothers and sisters, know this. Congregation, you who have yet to believe in Christ, know this. God has sent prophets and apostles to declare the will of God. And the will of God is this. Believe in Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins and believe on him and you will be saved. We're all sinners, each one of us. Everyone is born in sin. Everyone is conceived in sin. There is no such thing as an innocent baby because the sin of Adam is transferred to each one of us. And then we have our own sins that we commit. And everyone has a certain set of sins that they find pleasure in. And unless you repent of your sins and turn away from them and believe on Jesus Christ, you will die in your sins. No amount of good works, no amount of philanthropy, no amount of whatever you do out of your own strength would change the outcome. If the rich man had been good to Lazarus, but refused to believe in God, he would have ended up in hell. You see, if you believe that your works will save you, or that your goodness will outweigh your sin, tell me, by what standard do you measure that with? How much good do you have to do so that the scales balance in your favor to outweigh all the wickedness you've committed? Where is that scale? Where is that standard to measure that by? Imagine if you had to do, you were to bake a cake or cook, a, a, um, prepare a meal that you've never done before, and you were given a recipe without, without measurements. Here's some flour, some salt, some sugar, some yeast, or whatever. Now, make this meal. Well, how much flour? How much salt? How much sugar? Just figure it out. If you believe that's how you can be made right with God by your own good works, how much good works will it take? What's the balance? There's no way. On top of that, when you die, you stand before God, and you refuse to believe in Jesus Christ, you're standing before God naked of yourself. And God is going to say, who are you? I don't know you. I don't know you. Because you see, the only way we can approach God, the only way we can stand in the sight of God is to be covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves up with fig leaves, and God refused that. God had to slay an animal to then cover them 
which was pointing to Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God. In order for you to stand before God, to be accepted of God, you have to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which means you have to believe in him. Believe that his death on the cross paid a penalty for your sin. Do not believe in yourself, believe in Christ. If you believe in Christ, that he has taken away the curse, the judgment that hangs over you, then you will be saved. And on the day you die, you will meet Lazarus and you will meet Abraham. And instead of wailing and gnashing the teeth, you will hear the voices of joy. And you will see other fellow saints who have walked the walk before you. Brethren, this narrative should shock us. This narrative should make us rethink our lives. Where are you with God? Are you walking with Christ or not? Because if you are not, there is a hell and it's real. But if you are walking with Christ, then know this. When you die, you will be with him. For now, you have been saved. You have been justified by faith in him. And the words you will hear when you stand before God will be this. Enter thou, good and faithful servant, to the joy of your salvation. And he will embrace you into his bosom. Let us stand as we close in prayer. <clears throat> our Lord and our God, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ, who alone is our salvation, to give you thanks for this mercy that you have shown to us. Mercy means something that we do not deserve. And who here deserves mercy? But yet you have loved us. And you have desired to show us mercy in and through your only son, Jesus Christ. Not by our hands, but by Christ's pierced hands are we found accepted in your sight. We ask, O oh Lord, even now, search our hearts. Search our hearts, whether we are in you or not. And may your Holy Spirit even now work a good work of conversion in those who have yet to believe in you, that they too may be born again and have the eyes of faith to see Jesus, to look upon Jesus and know his salvation. Lord, our, Lord, our God, we pray. Be merciful, even now. And may we walk with humility and not with pride. Remove haughtiness from our heart and replace it with humility, Lord. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our only Lord and Savior. Amen. <clears throat>